So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do under Robin underscore Norgren or at my website, www.josiesartschool.com. I'd like to start with some words from a book called The Burning Word by Judith A. Kunst, and it's in a chapter called Community. To argue is to love. The word is real. The word is burning. In the Jewish view, Torah is far too hot to handle on one's own. Make for yourself a teacher, says the oldest tractate of the Talmud. Acquire for yourself a friend and give everyone the benefit of the doubt. To the ancient rabbis and to many practicing Jews today, studying the Bible is a distinctly communal activity. As young children in yeshiva, Observant Jews are paired off into study friends. As adults, and as adults years later, they gather in the Bet Midrash or study house. In a group of 10 or 20 or 100 to hunch in parts in pairs over open Bibles, perhaps with the same partner they've had since youth. The the Yevruda relationship is so significant that the Israeli army takes pains to assign childhood Bet Ruvtat to serve in the same combat units. A teacher announces the appointed Torah portion, but does not interpret it or even read it. Instead, all over the room, one Yevruta begins to read the assigned section out loud. The other half of each pair listens intently. One would have to with so many voices raised in the room, then jumps in with the response. Thus, commencing an intense, often hours-long session of questioning, answering, arguing, a robust communal exploration of a text which tradition holds. God commands them to interpret. In Judaism, intimacy cannot be separated from argument, nor can reading or study be separated from community. I have suggested in an earlier chapter that conversation is a good descriptor of the way Midrash approaches the Bible. Yet the casual, unattached encounter we usually associate with that word is a far cry from the hectic intensity of a bet mizrash, where all over the room heads are vigorously nodding and hands are slicing the air to emphasize a point, flipping knowingly through the pages of heavy volumes to find proof texts located all over the Torah and the Talmud. This is high-stakes conversation where not just the text on the table, but also the multiple arguments over what it seems are considered sacred, over what it means are considered sacred, vital to the religious life of everyone in the room, of the entire community, and of the entire nation of Israel. This intense communal conversation, anchored in Torah, isn't bounded by time or space. It spreads across generations, ethnicities, and languages. The dialogue between two Yefrutat is mirrored on the page in front of them in blocks of Hebrew text arranged around each portion of scripture, presenting commentary by rabbis from many different centuries. From Stephen Pressfield's book, The, The War of Art, Resistance and love. Resistance is directly proportional to love. If you're feeling massive resistance, the good news is it means there's tremendous love there too. If you didn't love the project that is terrifying you, you wouldn't feel anything. 
The opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. The more resistance you experience, the more important your unmanifested art, project, enterprise is to you, and the more gratification you will feel when you finally do it. Resistance and being a star. Grandiose fantasies are a a symptom of resistance. They're the sign of an amateur. The professional has learned that success, like happiness, comes as a byproduct of work. The professional concentrates on the work and allows rewards to come or not come whenever they like. Resistance and isolation. Sometimes we balk at embarking on an enterprise because we're afraid of being alone. We feel comfortable with the tribe around us. It makes us nervous going off into the woods on our own. Here's the trick. We're never alone. As soon as we step outside the fire, the campfire glow, our muse lights on our shoulder like a butterfly. The act of courage calls forth infallibility, infallibly, that deeper part of ourselves that supports and sustains us. Have you seen interviews with the young John Lemon, Lennon or Bob Dylan when the reporter tries to ask about their personal selves? The boys reflect these queries with withering sarcasm. Why? Because Lennon and Dylan know that the part of them that writes the songs is not them, not the personal self that is of such surpassing fascination in their boneheaded interrogators. Lennon and Dylan also know that the part of themselves that does the writing is too sacred, too precious, too fragile to read to be redacted into sound bites for the titillation of would-be idolaters who are themselves caught up in their own resistance. So they put them on and blow them off. It is a commonplace among artists and children at play that they're not aware of time or solitude while they're chasing their vision. The hours fly, the sculptress and the tree climbing climbing tyke Both look up blinking when mom calls, supper time. Friends sometimes ask, don't you get lonely sitting by yourself all day? At first it seemed odd to hear myself answer no. Then I realized that I was not alone. I was in the book. I was with the characters. I was with myself. Not only do I not feel alone with my characters, They are more vivid and interesting to me than the people in my real life. If you think about it, the case can't be otherwise. In order for a book, or any project or enterprise, to hold our attention for the length of time it takes to unfold itself, it has to plug into some internal perplexity or passion that is of paramount importance to us. That problem becomes the theme of our work even if we can't at the start understand or articulate it. As the characters arise, each embodies infallibly an aspect of that dilemma, that perplexity. These characters might not be interesting to anyone else, but they're absolutely fascinating to us. They are us, meaner, smarter, sexier versions of ourselves. It is fun to be with them because they're wrestling with the same issue that has its hooks into us. They're our soulmates, our lovers, our best friends, even the villains, especially the villains. Even in a book like this, which has no characters, I don't feel alone because I'm imagining the reader, whom I conjure as an aspiring artist, much like my younger self, less grizzled self, to whom I hope to impact and impart a little starch and inspiration and prime a little with some hard knocks wisdom and a fo- and a few tricks of the trade this is from my book deepen the way you live your life i am wondering how risky that leap you've been meaning to take truly is Kate Capshaw says, 
the moment somebody says to me, this is very risky, is the moment it becomes attractive to me. Is there something you've been thinking about doing that feels a bit risky? Think about one particular something and think about what good could come from taking the risk. Think about it this way. Are some of the risks simply obstacles you actually have the ability to get past? Now think about the true risks in the opportunity. Where are you at in making this decision to go for it?